Good to go. All right. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you uh, Rachel Lamb, um, master of uh, sangria, uh, veteran <laughs> of customer service, and now a technical writer who is going to talk about uh, what's uh, what you can learn from customer service that will help you be a better technical communicator. Go for it, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Now, I know some of you probably thinking of that or going through that announcement and are like, okay, where is she going with this? I'm wondering what I'm on about. And a lot, I know first had a couple of horror stories about customer service that you shared a bit earlier during the networking. So I just encourage you guys to hear me out for a bit, because not only are technical writers and customer service agents a lot more similar than you might think, there's a good bit that we can learn from the other side. So in the next 45 minutes to an hour, give or take, we're going to learn a couple, we're going to go through a couple of different ideas, how to keep your customers or your writers in mind, or users in mind as you write, how to think like the system and use it to your advantage, and what to do when the unexpected comes up. And so how are customer service agents and technical writers alike? Where are the similarities? Well, neither of us ha have spent our time in the spotlight. We don't have the kind of flash pizzazz of marketing. We don't have the coding muscles that developers can flex most of the time. And we're not at the top like the managers calling the shots and making the big bucks. Frankly, both of us, I think, tend to get a bit of a bad rep in, in the popular conscience. No one ever really likes calling customer service just as no one ever really reads the manual at least from what I've seen, but we're still important. We are support players, making sure that the users, or should I say customers, get the help they need. For technical writers, we give users the resources to put the product to use. And for customer service, they're there to assist when the customer needs something product related that they can't get anywhere else. Marketing, development managers, they can talk about what the product can do, but it's not something the customer wants to hear when the product isn't working. For customer service and technical writers, we talk about how we can actually help the customer, actually help the user. We're there when they need us and even when they don't. And without us, companies would lose their customer bases pretty quickly. So who am I to talk? How do I know this? Well, to start, I'm a technical writer who's currently employed for a company in Burlingame, California. I obtained my, my certificate in technical writing and communication back in 2019. And I'm currently pursuing a certificate in user experience and web design. But before all of this, before I got my start here, I worked for eight years as a customer service agent. I was part of an ISO certified in-house call center for a major company based in the US. And I worked and I took calls for two other divisions handling everything from basic requests to the escalated situations. And towards the end of my time there, I actually got to work on department documentation with this permission of my supervisors. I've seen both worlds. And it's why I say that not only are we not so different, but there are things that we as technical writers can learn from customer service. We'll start off with getting to know your customers, even when you'll never meet them. Now, here is where I believe the biggest difference lies between technical writers and customer service. In a call center, you're constantly interacting with your customers. If you work a day shift, you can easily take hundreds of calls talking to hundreds of different people. If, and even if you work an evening or an overnight shift, you're likely still talking to hundreds of callers over the course of a week. The only barrier is the fact that, at least in a call center, you never really see each other. You're on opposite ends of the phone connection. Now, don't get me wrong, it's stressful and exhausting. And I was just working evening shift, so I didn't have to go through what the day shift went through. But it really gives you a sense of who your customers are talking to them that often, what they need, what they struggle with, what they want to see, and what can make or break their day. Well, with technical writers, it's a very different story. The vast majority of us will never interact with our users. Now, there could be several reasons for that. They, maybe your company doesn't really want you interacting with, with users. They want users to only see a certain division, like public relations. And maybe they don't have the resources to conduct the kind of thorough re user research some uh, others are. But regardless, it's a very rare circumstance to actually know your users on the same level that customer service experiences. Now, when I was working back on our, on our department documentation, I was in that very rare circumstance. Specifically, I worked on procedures for our escalation team. Not only did I know the skill level and experience of my users, I knew most of them on a personal basis. I, know, I knew which shifts they worked, who had families, what their hobbies were, all kinds of stuff. 
But in my current position, it's a it's different. I know some things about my users, but I'm aware that I will never ever get to meet them. So this kind of begs the question: How do you write for your users when you know you'll never meet them? Well, pinnacle writers do have a variety of ways of getting around this kind of barrier. If the company does conduct any kind of user research, writers can look at that kind of research and research and draw their own conclusions. They can look at for help forums, comment sections, anywhere where users can post feedback and look at what they're saying. They can talk to people within the organization or company who do interact with users, see what kind of things they're observing or hearing. But one of the most interesting tools that I've found used is creating and using personas. Now, I know this will probably be old hat to a lot of the, a lot of people here tonight, but for newer technical writers who are watching the recording, you, personas are user profiles that are based on interactions with real users. They kind of act as a real person and with a name and a story. And we rest engage with them, and they typically rent, represent a certain type of user trends. Now, looking back at my own experience and the thousands, okay, probably millions of customers that I spoke to over my eight years, I definitely began to notice different types of users emerging. I had my own set of basic personas based on my experiences that I could write for. And I believe that other technical writers might benefit from these as well. So let's dive into them, these generic customer personas from my eight years in customer service. We'll start off with Alyssa. Now, Alyssa just started her job at a restaurant three weeks ago. She's getting the hang of things, but she knows she has a ways to go and is still building her confidence. Now today, her boss has asked her to call customer service and place a chemical order. She has a list of things that she needs to get, a little bit of information from her boss. But she's never done anything this important before, and she is a bundle of nerves. Alyssa is our first time caller. She this is the equivalent of an entry-level user, as we call them in technical writing. She has no prior experience and is engaging with the service for the very first time. Now, for Alyssa, she wants to get this order placed, but she also wants the experience to be as painless as possible. Now, this pain could come from errors on customer services and say if they get, get a product number mixed up, but it could also come, come up if she runs into something she's not prepared for. Say if they ask for contact information or delivery instructions and her boss didn't give her that information, she's gonna get be even more nervous and think, oh God, I've got something wrong. Now, now for the customer service agent, it's their job not only to take Alyssa's order, but to guide her through the experience without quoting Anna Garten and saying, how easy was that? <laughs> For the technical writer, it's their job to make it clear to Alyssa both what she needs to do and how to do it. For both, you're not only mitigating the pain that she's anticipating, you're giving her the confidence that she could come back and do this again. Now we move on next to John. Now, John is our regular caller. He's been working at the, at the same restaurant for a couple of years now. He's looking to join the management at some point soon. Not only does he know what to expect when he calls customer service, he's on a first name basis with his field rep. Now tonight, the dish machine started making a weird noise, kind of like an just something really annoying in the background that just grind, grinds at you. Now he would rather get it taken care of before it gets worse. So he calls customer service to place a service request. Now as a regular caller, John represents a user with more experience. He's called before, he knows what to expect, and he's used, used to what, how customer service handles calls like his. Like, he may not know everything, but he's, but he's familiar enough that, he'll, that he knows exactly what to expect. Like Alyssa, he's hoping to get his request taken care of and as quickly as possible, but he's not nervous. He's expect, and he's not expecting pain. He's expecting consistency. He'll allow for some deviation if it helps him, but he knows how the calls are supposed to flow. And if something comes up, if there's a hitch in the process, Depending on that hitch, it may put them on edge. Now, for both customer service agents and for technical writers, the key to helping John is more than just making sure that he gets what he needs. Their job is also to ensure the consistency. And for customer service agents, they have a script that they follow that dictates the flow of the call and gets them the information they need. They can deviate from the script when they need to, especially if it gets them important information to help the caller. However, they're typically expected to stick to that script and that consistent script, that flow is part of what John's expecting. For writers, keeping terminology and language consistent helps the most here, but you also need to ensure the accuracy of your documentation. If something's not right, if there's something inconsistent, John may be among the first to notice and he may not be too happy about it. So with John taken care of, we move on now to Carmen, our confusion caller. Now, Carmen's an accountant at our fictional restaurant. She's kept the books for a while and she knows what expenses to expect. 
she's just received two invoices in the mail from your company, and they look almost identical to her. And she's concerned that the company is getting double charged, worried about what's going on and not wanting to spend more money than she has to. She calls customer service. Now, Carmen needs to resolve in her confusions regardless of how, how any kind of confusion came about. In her case, it's the potentially duplicate invoices, but there's that is just one example. If we change the situation, have her interacting with some kind of software, she may run across a feature that doesn't do what she thinks it's supposed to. Callers and users can encounter misinformation, stumble into situations they weren't expecting, or even struggle with a language barrier. Now, to resolve this, Carmen needs one of two things: confirmation and clarification. If there is a duplicate charge, she needs confirmation of it and help to fix it. If there's any differences in the invoice, she needs clarification of those differences. Let's say in this example that there's that the invoices are actually from different months. She needs to know where on the invoices to see those to find those dates and distinctions between each invoice. Now, a lot of colors in her shoes may become frustrated, combative, belligerent, focusing on getting that confirmation that they've got it right over anything else. And it's times like these where that old saying, the customer is always right, really strikes a nerve with me. The customer can be right a lot of times, but it doesn't happen as often as one might think. Many times, often through no fault of their own, they have it wrong. Now, for a customer service agent, it's their job to confirm what's actually going on in Carmen's case and to clarify and resolve as necessary. For the writer, it's their job to ensure the accuracy of their documentation and to prevent as many misunderstandings as possible. Warnings help us do resources the customers can turn to when the docs can't provide them what they need. But in this case, you also, like in, like in John's case, you want to keep your language terminology consistent, but also as simple as possible in both positions. This is especially important if any part of your user base or any customer that calls in deals with a language barrier, say that they're not quite as fluent in English. If the users can't understand what they're what you're trying to say, they're going to be even more confused than they start. We now move on then to Jose, our emergency caller. Now, Jose has been working at the restaurant for a couple years now, and tonight the dish machine started smoking drunky sparks from him. He and his crew have shut the machine off, and thankfully everybody's okay. No one's been hurt. However, they're in the middle of a Friday night dinner rush, and we're putting the situation back in the before times when everybody went out for a Friday night dinner to celebrate the end of the week. So obviously they need the dishwasher back up stat. So he calls customer service, hoping to get his rep out within the hour. Now, Jose is the caller in the middle of a crisis and he's under a lot of stress and a lot of pressure to get everything resolved. Not only does he want it resolved, but he wants it resolved as quickly as possible. Depending on the emergency, some callers in his, in his shoes may prioritize that particular speed. Help cannot come quickly enough. Furthermore, he may not be satisfied with just a guarantee of service. Jose may want more proof that his rep is actually on the way. And he feels like he's not, and if he feels he's not getting that, he will escalate to the next level. I, he's going to ask to speak to a manager. Now, for the customer service agent, successfully helping an emergency caller depends on a number of factors. He's down to get information gathering, getting those important details making sure that it's escalated to the right level. If it's if they need just an urgent marker or if they need to actually get some managers involved. And finally, they need to get good contact information in case of any complications. If Jose's rep or the rep's manager sees anything that comes up or if they can't make it out right away, they need his information to reach him back and let him know. For technical writers, it's a bit different. We're in a bit more preventative in case here, but it's not just the kind of prevent, preventing of prevent eh. you think I'd be able to talk straight after 80 years of customer service but I still get tongue tied <laughs> the focus shifts more from preventing the issues and preventing the confusion to giving them the resources they obviously those warnings need to be there that ter language terminology needs to be consistent and easy to understand but listing the resources becomes more important in this case if Jose is instead using an app that just don't function he needs to get in contact with the help desk and he should be able to find their information in your documentation. Hmm. There we go. So now we'll move on to the angry colors where there, there's no real cut and dry way of dealing with things, not even in customer service. It's handled on a case by case basis, but we'll go through them anyways. We'll start off with Sam, the angry caller. 
Now, Sam has been dealing with the dishing machine, running through the soap extremely quickly. It's just eating that stuff up. It's been going on for a while, and they're certain that their coworkers have already called. They call customer service to ask why this hasn't been resolved yet, and to get service and more soap. The agent who takes the call just takes a quick glance at the call history. No one has actually called customer service since last month. Now, this was always one of the more difficult types of callers to handle. They will say they've called 12 times with no response and want a manager on the phone immediately. The problem is often through that we don't have a record or that some, that, or that some kind of action has led things to just be exacerbated. Most of the time, these callers would insist to me that they'd call, called quite a few times and then later tell me they called their rep directly instead of calling customer service like they should have done. Oftentimes, though, they just forget the call. It happens. We're all human. And the thing to remember is that nearly all angry callers still have an actual problem that needs to be addressed. It may have been exacerbated by, through their actions or lack thereof, but they still actually need help. Customer service might have been able to do, do more if someone had called in the first place, but they may not. But in Sam's case, they may not be aware of how things actually transpired. They, I mean, they did think their coworkers already called. And depending on the stress levels and anger, they may not react well to learning that they're actually first call. In this kind of circumstance, they might most even most irrational angry callers will still usually ask to speak to a manager. Again, it's case by case basis in, in these cases. And last but not least, we have Alex, the justifiably angry caller. Alex is one of the managers at our fictional restaurant. She knew the health inspector was going to be out this week. She called last week three times asking for her field rep to come out and check the machine. The rep never came out. The, rest, the health inspector came by and the restaurant did not pass. Now, the inspector will be back in about 24 to 48 hours expecting something to have changed. Now, this calls needs her rep out there as the area manager. She wants them want in contact with her immediately and somebody out there tonight. And she calls customer service to try to make that happen. If it can't, she is going to take her business elsewhere. Now, these were the kind of calls that I hated taking because many times there wasn't much more I could do. We would already have records of each time the customer called in. And typically, they would have you know we would know if they had called multiple times. We would have already escalated them at least once already. And depending on how serious the issue may have gotten or how upset they are, these customers are will call multiple times within one day or even multiple times within an hour. If you're working an evening or weekend shift, or God forbid, a Saturday night, you've likely spoken to the customer more than once already or taken all of their calls. Most of those nights, I'd be essentially acting as the manager for the department because I was the most senior agent available. There was nobody else there. Basically, all the managers work normal business hours. And even if I didn't get the call when it first came in, if, some, if someone got that one and called the escalation line, the call would likely find me eventually. Now, in this situation, callers like Alex are doing everything right. They're taking the correct course of action, but they're still not getting the help they need. Regardless of why that help isn't coming, it's a situation that no one wants to deal with. Alex is upset, understandably so, and she won't just ask for escalation in this case. She's going to expect it due to the severity of the issue. Most times, you can still recover the situation, especially if a caller realizes that you're just the messenger. They're not actually angry with you, they're angry with the person you're giving the message to. <laughs> but for Alex in this case, especially given that involved a health inspection, Unless you wish to pull a miracle, you're like being a loser as a customer. Now, these personas won't apply to every situation. And your company may have persona, different personas that are more relevant to what you're writing about. But they're meant to provide, especially newer technical writers, kind of a frame of reference as to who your users might be, especially in, that even if you'll never get to meet the real ones. They're based on a lot of real different situations that I've seen and observed over my over the eight years I spent in customer service, and I found them very useful as a kind of set of tools in my arsenal. So with that covered, we now move on to our second point of the night, thinking like the system. Now, normally when a custom customer uses a product, they're interacting with it directly. If it's a software application, they're directly participating in that experience, they're clicking things. And payment providers draft their documentation with this in mind, but for customer service, it gets into different, especially if you work in a call center. You, as this agent, can see the system and know all, okay, most of its inner workings, but the customer never sees those inner workings. Their only way of navigating things is through their interaction with you, 
you become the user interface. And I'll be honest, realizing this is fascinating and kind of terrifying. I only came, came to realize this towards the end of my time in customer service when I started working on my certificate in technical write, writing. One thing to understand the system on one level and another to actually know how to act as the user interface for it. It's not something that I've found a way to experience as a technical writer. Now, acting as the interface kind of encourages a different way of thinking. When the customer asks for something, you know the exact procedures to go through, what to ask them for, and how things should play out. It's a bit more linear. It's kind of like branching paths through that script we talked about earlier. Hmm. It's not just working from that script, because understanding the actions that make the script successful, knowing how to go about things based on what input the customer is giving you. Now, a lot of that understanding does come with experience and practice. The reason I came to think that the system was because I spent so much time with that system. I was no expert, but I knew enough to be dangerous. I knew ways of getting information that a lot of, even some of the agents who had spent more time than I did there, didn't even know about. However, I still think there's, that there's every way for a technical writer to acquire this kind of thinking and use it to their advantage. So how does one go about achieving this kind kind of this kind of system thinking well here's a couple things that i did that i would recommend in this case one would be talking to developers and subject matter experts the people who made the system and know how it works for me back when i was with my previous company i would go i would go to the agents who had been there longer and ask them for things on different situations or I, huh, not for a moment i would ask them kind of any question any questions that I need to ask. And even if they're stupid questions, you should ask those questions. It's something that you should be clear on. And even if they feel like it, there really isn't a stupid question in this kind of case. If it's something you don't know it's and, or need to know, then it's something you should ask. If possible, ask for a kind of, ask for a demonstration. From what I've seen, not only would most developers and SMEs be willing to give, give you that kind of demonstration, they would love a chance to show off their work. Frame it as that and get, get a little bit easier. If your, if your team has access to any use cases or test cases, basically kind of cases of how the system would react just written, written out for ease of use, take a look at those. Otherwise, get, the, get your hands on the product and test it yourself. Get to know how it works on a hands-on level. Now, if your company has a test system or prototype, ask for access to it. And this is something I've been using to my advantage both in my current job and in my previous job. Back in customer service, I knew we had a test system because we used it for training. When I started working on our documentation, I asked for access to that system so I could test all the procedures out to make sure they worked without making any permanent changes in our main system, without screwing everything up. And in my current position, one of the first things I'm granted when I start on a project is access to a test system in a staging environment. And I know who to contact if I have questions about it. But let's say you don't have access to any of this. Well. If your product is publicly, avail publicly available, get your hands on it there. Become an end user yourself. And just any kind of way where you can get, get your hands on the system and just explore it, get to know every nook and cranny, even some things that you might not, not have thought of before. Now, there are some benefits and drawbacks. By knowing how the system reacts, you can anticipate when errors come up and how severe they will be. If you're working in a test system, you could even let the developers know, know when you encounter those bugs and they can help and they can help to resolve problems before the system even goes into production. And you can help your users avoid those kinds of errors by noting by noting them in notes, tips, warnings, anything that could give them any kind of advantage on that. Now, it, there, this kind of thinking still has some drawbacks, though. It does require a very solid foundation. You need to know that system in great detail and know, enough to know how it will react in a variety of circumstances. Not all of them, but a good enough variety to, to be dangerous. And it can be easy to, when you're thinking about this, to focus on what the system will do as and what it can do. Even when the user maybe doesn't need to know the, all the little nitty gritty details. They just need enough to know how to accomplish their task. You might be able to write off all the details of how the automatic payment system works down to the coding, but all the customer wants to know is how they can set their account up on automatic payment. Even with the difficulties, I still think this, this kind of thinking is worth it. And Tenpires even already have ways of using it to their advantage in the form of system responses. Now, for the newer technical writers watching the recording on this one, 
And system responses are statements that come directly after a step or a, ta or a task, outlining how the system will or should respond to the previous user action. We've got an example over here. In the navigation pane, click our products. And we have under that step, the our products page loads. Hmm. You can use these to communicate how system, how that, yeah. Really still can't talk after all those years. Ah, still get tongue tied. Mm. So, and so you, so I guess the biggest thing that I found when I started using them was just the use of present tense here for me was very jarring, but because I always thought the future tense would be better. Say the product page, the R products page will load. But as I started seeing more often, I'm understanding the use for that present tense. It gives you a better feeling of immediacy. If you say the R products page will load, okay, when will it load? If you say it loads, the customer knows to expect it pretty much immediately. And if they don't see it happening, they know something is wrong. So it gets across, I believe a little better, how, what, does, what the user should expect from the system. So a few key takeaways before we move on to the next part. For, first thing, learn everything you can about the system and the pro or product that you're writing about. Enough that you can kind of follow its internal logic and know how it re will respond to users in our, user interactions. You don't have to be a subject matter expert, but you should know enough about your system or product to convey to your user what they need to know and how to get the most out of it. Don't explain everything about how it works. Focus on what the user needs it to do and use system responses where you can in order to clarify to the user how the system will respond to their actions. Hmm. All right, so we come to the last part in our agenda the unexpected, the kind of calls that you can't train for. Now you think that after eight years, I would have I would know how to take every kind of call imaginable. <laughs> I honestly wouldn't say that. Yes, I could handle nearly all the calls that came to me, but there were so many instances where neither my training nor my experience could really prepare me properly or any agent for that matter. <laughs> there will always be th those ca calls that, that catch even the veteran agents off guard. They range from the truly bizarre to the ones that make you scream internally, oh my God, please tell me you called the police first. I sincerely wish I was kidding on that one. Even in technical writing, there will be unexpected situations. And I'm not just talking about those projects that just come up out of the blue with unreasonable depth, unreasonably short deadlines, though there will be plenty of those. There will be a large number of scenarios that you won't be able to account for. One of your users is going to stumble across something you never would have considered. And there will be bugs in the system and times when your sub, even your subject matter experts will say, I've never seen this before. This is okay. It's not possible to prepare for absolutely everything. We're human after all. And we can't shove the, entire, the knowledge of every possibility into our brains. Frankly, I think that would hurt a lot. Even team leads and subject matter experts come across situations they never expected to see all the time. Remember that it's not a personal failing. Don't blame yourself for it. No one should really expect expect you to be prepared for every situation. What matters more, in my opinion, is not how you prepare, but how you handle the situations that you're thrust into. So let's let's go through how a customer service agent would handle the unexpected. For customer service, it starts with gathering information. Get as many details as you can from the customer. Ask, ask those kind of probing questions and follow-up questions. And even the innocuous details, get them down. You want me to get a better picture of what's going on in order to make the best possible decision on what to do. You also should probably make clear whether they meant to call you or if they meant to call somebody else. If you do that early enough, you can save yourself a lot of hassle. And once the customer is giving you all they can, time to go up to the next level. You call the escalation line and run the team lead who answers through a situation. If they know what to do, they'll instruct you on what to do or ask, or ask you to pass the caller off to them. If they don't, will usually have some further questions in mind to ask the customer or, or ideas on who may be able to help them. But let's say it's near the point where there isn't a team lead available or they can't exactly help you. It's time to consider other resources. Who can help the customer the most in this situation based on the knowledge you, you've gained right now? Hmm. Is, there, is there someone who can take their call or do they need to speak to a field manager? Once you decide who would be the most likely likely to help you get the customer over to that resource typically this would involve a direct transfer but if you can't get them to, to them directly just make sure they get make sure they get their contact information 
Typically, I would have done both just in case the call got dropped in the transfer. It happens more times than you'd expect. But, in, but like, like with emergency and angry callers, you need to be ready to dip in an angry situation. They're going to be stressed, frustrated, not any number of things. And they tend to fall into those categories more often than not, into those kind of user types. Now, in technical writing, it does get a bit, it does become a bit different. Unlike a customer service agent taking a call, you generally have a lot more time to react in the situation. I mean, you still have a deadline, but you're not just dealing with everything in a matter of a few minutes. Use that time to your advantage. Research research comes up. Yes. You have access to the products and see what you can find out by testing it. Talk to team leads, developers, SMEs, anybody you think might be relevant. Even those people who don't know how to help the, with the issue, they may know someone who actually will. Next, we determine the urgency of the issue. Will this cause the product to fail catastrophically? And how many users are going to encounter it? Is someone complaining about it on social media? Because we live in that age, of course. Depending on the answers to those questions, this may determine whether a revised version needs to go out tonight or if it can wait a couple days. Finally, once you've got this all figured out, it's time to write. It's time to start generating that content and get those revisions done. Now, I probably really alluded to this too much so far, but I think it's been a little apparent that customer, the technical writers tend to be a more proactive, more preventative force. You know, customer service is more reactive. Their customer services in the heat of the moment, technical writers are kind of, are a bit farther back, but still making making sure their stuff is getting ready. So we're, we may not be there in the moment as technical writers in the heat of it, but our documentation is. Okay, it should be. As a technical writer, you can prevent a lot of unexpected situations in your for your users with that documentation. All scenarios that your team is aware of at the time. Surface the scenarios by both severity and frequency. Ask those questions again. How often will users encounter each scenario? For each one, will it cause a system crash or just a minor visual glitch? Once you're done with this, cover the scenarios that come up the most frequency or that would result in the most severe user errors. You want to make sure those are in first because your users need those the most. Make sure those are in before you go about any adding any less common scenarios. Finally, the well, not finally, but the last part in this first part is to list content information for resources that your users can reach if they still need help, if the documentation for some reason still isn't enough. If there's an IT desk for customers, the customers need to be able to, should be able to find the means to contact them in your document. Is there a help forum? Is there an online live chat, an email address or phone number? All of that needs to be in the doc along with the name of that support team and potentially their operating hours. If you list, and should be listed wherever relevant. If there's anyone who can help a customer in an important situation, make sure their information is in your documents. Finally, your documents are living things in a sense. They evolve with time as your product evolves with each iteration. Thus, review and revise regularly. Even when you haven't come across an unexpected situation, make sure your documentation is still up to date. Now, I know for some, especially people watching the recording, this can be a lot to take in, especially for anyone who's new to technical writing. It won't be as crazy as you might expect, and these methods will be able to help you out a lot. So, now that I've nearly talked my throat out of existence and gotten super tongue-tied, let's just recap what we covered today. One, right, and even though you'll never meet them, how to think like the system and use that thinking to your advantage, how to handle those situations that are unexpected that your training will never prepare you for, and what customer service agents and technical providers have in common through all of that. Now, before I stop the recording and get to the Q&A part, I just want to take a moment to make an appeal on behalf of customer service agents everywhere. Yes, there are the horror stories like what Bruce shared with, with the people that never called back, and the automated prompts that you can never follow and that you never understand your voice. But for every one of these, there is an agent out there who genuinely wants to help you. Not only that, but they will go the extra mile if you treat them with patience and respect. I spent eight years in that kind of situation. It was satisfying to extend, but it's also stressful, exhausting, and pretty darn thankless. I'm glad I've moved on to technical writing. I love this industry and I'm not going back. But I'm also not going to forget where I came from. I'm just speaking from experience. 
a little patience and a simple thank you can really make an agent's day. I mean, how would you feel if someone not only read your user guide, but also sent you a thank you note? There we go.